Welcome to the workshop, Unlocking Generative AI Safely and Responsibly. This is brought to you by Microsoft and Cyberlight. I am Nina Bawal. I'm a co-founder at Cyberlight, and we're really excited to bring to you a very interactive workshop in which you'll get to know more about generative AI, what an LLM is, and how to make it work for you. But we'll also learn more about how to be safe and responsible when using such powerful tools as we will be to today. We want to ensure that when you are online, that you are safe and you're in an experience that you can enjoy and interact with and be aware of what your critical eye needs to watch out for. So today, let's go through what we're going to learn about. First of all, I'm going to deep dive into what exactly is generative AI? How does it work? And what is a large language model? The next, we're going to work on how we can craft our own prompts and understanding what they are and how to utilize them effectively. We're gonna explore two characters, one named Gina, who's fighting for the ocean. And we'll watch as she uses her skills and uses generative AI as a co-pilot to bring her world to life. And Alex, a very different character, who's really enjoys gaming, We'll look at how he uses generative AI to bring some of his ideas to life into a real life game. So those are all exciting things with lots of try it yourselves, lots of interactions. So first of all, please go ahead and make sure that you have Microsoft Edge downloaded. This will allow you to access Microsoft Copilot. And also what you may need is a Microsoft account. Fear not, if you don't have those as a school, you can go ahead and use ChatGPT. You need to set up an open AI account and that will allow you to also use DALI when we start looking at images and the creation of those. So go ahead, make sure as a class, you have something that you can work on. Refer to your teachers to what is best for you in this moment. So let's get started. What is generative AI? It's an exciting, frontier in technology and for many of us it came out of the blue and it was exciting to see. It is a tool that can generate new content, text, images and videos and even coding and it feels like it does it just like that. How it does this is it learns patterns from existing data and the understanding of context and intent of language. And that's where it really comes into its own. The nuance, the tone, the ability to work in multiple languages is fascinating. And one of the things I enjoy the most about generative AI is its ability to create images. I can sometimes have ideas that are floating around in my head, but have no real idea of how I can get them down and illustrated. I'm not the best drawer. But with the use of generative AI tools, I have seen some great images come to life with ideas I've just generated myself. So hopefully you'll experience all of this as we go through. Now, how does generative AI actually work? Well, first of all, you need to understand the concept of a large language model. And throughout the presentation, I go through what a large language model or generative AI is. I interchange the words because they can be used together. So First, let's deep dive into large language models. Now, this is a mathematical algorithm that takes a lot of data. I mean, think about billions of pieces of data. It could be text, books, it could be YouTube videos, lots of different things. And it collects all of this through a training process and comes up with the best predictive next thought. It is working on creating patterns that give you exceptional results. So if you type in pizza toppings, it will come up with all the different types of pizza toppings that people are utilizing around the world. It's a very, very clever tool. The applications that you may use to get into the large language models are ChatGPT, Microsoft Copilot. These are some of them that you will see and are incredibly popular and easy to access as well. They can be utilized by forming prompts and feel incredibly natural in conversation. How I use AI and how I invite you to use AI at school is to use it as a assistant. I can't afford my own assistant, but I do want to be more productive. I want more creativity in my work and I want 
things to work for me, to speak the my language, to communicate and help me learn the best way I can. And generative AI can do that. It complements my work. It makes sure that what I am looking at is very much the way that I learn and like information delivered to me. I use it as a co-pilot. I ensure that I don't let it drive me. I don't cut and paste. I don't use it as a cheating tool. I use it as an enabling tool. Now, what does that mean for you? How can you use generative AI? Now, one of the good things about generative AI is it can consume data very quickly. So if you have large text, something that's complex that you cannot get through, you find it really difficult because you don't comprehend it completely. We've all been in a situation where we keep rereading the same thing over and over again. Now, this is where generative AI can really work for you. I like things delivered to me in key learning points, and then I'll deep dive those points when I need them. So you can put in large amounts of text and ask it to summarize extensive notes into key points. You can go through those key points, work out where your weaknesses are, and deep dive into the points where you need. The other way I use it is with my kids. They're looking to revise. They're always worried about what questions might come up. And so we generate fresh practice questions for exam preparation. It's a great tutor. It's a tutor, unlike parents and teachers sometimes, that doesn't become impatient when you still haven't got the point. Even though you've seen it or learned it a couple of times, it will speak in your language. And I'll teach you through prompting how you can really work with it to speak in the tone and the language that you find the most desirable. And the third thing, the one that I get excited by, I'm a visual learner. Of course, not everything that's given to me can be created into great pictures, but with generative AI, it can. It can produce creative images that I can utilize. You can do the same. If you want a school project to come to life, if you feel like you've got an idea, but you just don't have the skills to put it to paper, you can use generative AI to come up with great pictures and visuals to really bring what's in here out into the open. So AI is your co-pilot and it's important all the way through your journey using generative AI that you remain the captain of your journey. It is a Impressive assistant, but it does have its flaws and it can be imperfect. Like with any technology, we need to be careful and remain in control. We cannot hand over information to generative AI tools and believe everything it's telling us. As we go through the workshop, I will tell you more about fabrications, but it does fabricate, it does have bias, its outputs do have security risks. And these are the risks that I will go through and show you how they manifest, what they may look like. So when you're using these tools, you yourself can have those aha moments when you think, mm, this looks suspicious, I'm not sure if I should trust the output and double check. If you are going to use such powerful tools, it's important that you remember that generative AI cannot think, it is not human. It feels human because it has tone, it has nuance but it is a predictive tool. It's predicting the next pattern. Therefore, it can get its predictions wrong because the internet has a lot of information and not always will it always come out with the right response. Let's get started though. Let's first of all see how do we utilize generative AI? Now, back in the old days, only a couple of years ago, you may be doing the same now, we go to our favorite search engine and we put in what we need to know about. For this example, if you are doing a history project on the Roman Empire, you may simply type in history of the Roman Empire and you're searching for a response. Your search engine will come up with the top responses of which there may be thousands and they may not be applicable to you. It may be a news article, it may be a blog, it may be a TikTok trend. It may not be applicable to the work you need at school. So you sort through this information, and this can be inefficient. Now, LLMs means that we can learn this information in a much more conversational and interactive manner. They can be more efficient in giving you summary information and the clear information that you need. It does this through the art of prompting. 
it's actually called prompt engineering. And we're gonna work through how to create good prompts together. A prompt is something that we craft to generate a desired output. And it can be really, really supportive to our work if we master the skill in making sure we get the right information to create the right response. Let's have a look at the elements of a good prompt. Here's a prompt I came up with earlier. Let's go through it together. The prompt is, act as a helpful tutor who breaks down complex subjects into easy explanations. I want you to explain the process of photosynthesis to a 14 year old to write with biology exam preparation. Your answer should be 300 words written in a tone that's friendly and educational. Let's break this prompt down. First of all, I've given my prompt to persona, a helpful tutor, and my objective. I want to explain photosynthesis. After that, I explain the audience who will be receiving the information. In this case, it's a 14-year-old student. And then I look at the context. What does the tool need to know? In this instance, it's assisting me with a biology exam preparation. And then I want to put some boundaries around the whole prompt. My boundaries here is should be 300 words and the tone needs to be friendly and educational. Here's some top tips when you're creating your own prompts. Give very, very clear instructions. The clearer the instructions, the more the prompt will work for you. Use words such as explain, translate, summarize or compare. Always provide context. The more information you can give, more background information, you will get a better result for you. You can give it a project type, such as a short story, report or outline. And you will hear me say this way too many times throughout this workshop, but iterate and experiment. You may find, and I've heard so many people say, I've tried these tools and they really don't work for me. But actually it's a skill. You need to continue on the skill and you may require several rounds of reiteration until you start getting the answers you want. Now I'm sure you're all itching to give it a go. So let's get familiar with these LMs and give it a go ourselves. We're going to do a task together. And as we go through this presentation, you'll see lots of try it yourself slides. If you have the time in the classroom, please do try this as a class together or take it away and try it at home. It will really sharpen your skills and ensure that you will be using these tools really successfully as you continue at school and right into your careers as well. So let's have a look at this task. You want to produce a short animated series to help students learn science and I've decided the first episode is going to be about photosynthesis. It's time to use the LLM to assist you. So step one, please go ahead and go to the tool that you had downloaded right at the beginning. Chat GPT, Microsoft Copilot. Pick the one you'll be using as a class. Step two, brainstorm with clear instructions. Try these prompts. Here's one prompt. Explain the process of photosynthesis in simple terms. Number two, list 10 keywords and their definitions relevant to photosynthesis. And third, write an outline for a short video about photosynthesis. Here we're using the tool to come up with ideas to really start bouncing things off when we're deciding what to put in this animated series, what to put into this episode. This widens our thought process up. Go ahead and give that a try. You can pause now. Now, back we come for step three. We're gonna apply the elements of a good prompt to craft our own. Here's a prompt. Act as a screenwriter. I want you to write a screenplay for an eight-year-old student to learn about photosynthesis. Your answer should be written in a happy and child-friendly tone and long enough for a 30-second video. Look at the elements we've put into this prompt. We have given it a persona. We have said who it is for, the eight-year-old child. We have given the objective to learn about photosynthesis. And we've put that boundary in play, the tone we want and the length of time. Please go ahead, cut and paste this if you can. 
or write it in to the large language model that you're using. Once you've done that, we can move forward to step four. Reiterate the prompt so that the output is for a three minute educational video for a 15 year old student. Try change the persona, objective, audience and context and boundaries to see the new results that AI will generate. Go ahead and try doing this. Take your time and come up with that video that suits the requirement of the 15 year old. Look at what the difference is between your step three, your eight year old child and your 15 year old. And if you have time, do discuss it as a class. So let's meet our first character. Gina is a wonderful teen who is ambitious and passionate about her environment. And she's on a mission to use the power of journalism and the power of the pen to fight climate change and to raise the issues. She wants to do this by producing an article which will shed a light on climate change and deep dive into the world of facts and stories to make a difference. So Gina really is a writer at heart and sees the power of using generative AI as a co-pilot. Sometimes we all are in a position where we need a start point. We need something that will provoke ideas and support us when we're trying to write a project or do something. And that's exactly how Gina's decided to use her generative AI tools. Gina's on a fresh investigation to report the devastating impact of plastic pollution on the beloved sea turtle population. What she wants to do is to paint a picture that will grip the hearts and minds of her readers, captivating them with an article. She has realised, as we may all, when we start something big, it's quite a task at hand, and she uses the power of Gen AI to assist her in creating this article. So let's take a look at the prompt that Gina uses. The prompt is, write an outline for a newspaper article that highlights the consequences of plastic pollution on the sea turtle population. This is a very well-formed prompt. And now it's time to try things ourselves. We're going to compose an outline and really work with Gina on how we can use generative AI to get different outputs and in a really effective manner. First of all, what we want to do is experiment and reiterate. We're going to use the sheet you can see on the right hand side and we're going to try doing each step together so first step is we're going to try the prompt so take your time write an outline for a newspaper article that highlights the consequences of plastic pollution on the sea turtle population this is the prompt that we're all going to utilize together then we're going to choose a tone here we're choosing a tone of informational and then we're going to choose how we want it formatted. As you see, we're getting more concise with what we want our output to be. So we want it to be as an idea. And then we want to tell the generative AI how long we want it. Now you've done that, let's experiment and retreat. What happens when you change to casual? What if you format it differently to paragraph? Which one do you prefer? What's working for you? A nice fun one to do is to change it to be a newspaper article or a fictional story. See what comes out and discuss with the whole class at step three of what has happened to the results and what you changed in the prompts and settings. What you'll find is everybody has a difference and that's the power of generative AI. Because of the nature of LLMs, even if you use the same prompt as Gina, your output will be different. That's because the AI tool is generating new responses to these prompts. Now let's go back to the character of Gina and take a cl closer look at the AI's output. So the AI has given a title to her prompt, Plastic Pollution's Devastating Impact on Sea Turtles. It then goes on to say, number one, introduction. Start by briefly introducing the crisis of plastic pollution in the oceans highlight the severe consequences on the sea turtles. Number two, provide compelling evidence to support your article's focus. Here are some facts you can consider using. And here the generative AI tool has given her three facts. The first one being 500 trillion pieces of plastic floating in our world's ocean. The next one, one of the major threats to sea turtles worldwide is the ingestion of plastic caused by human pollution. 
And lastly, scientists predict by that by 2032, there could be more plastic than fish in the ocean. These are three compelling facts that Generative AI have given her. Before giving her a conclusion, number three, encourage the readers to reduce plastic consumption and properly dispose of their waste. And conclude with the idea that the collective effort can save the sea turtles and our oceans. This structure is a great place for Gina to go away and start pulling together her article. However, if we take a look at it closer, Gina has spotted that the AI has given her facts that could be fabricated. These facts do feel compelling, they do feel right, but we have to be aware that generative AI is prone to fabrication. Now, if you look at this slide, all the pink slides are worth stopping on and having a look. Fabrication is a really important thing we are aware of. LLMs make things up that are not real. They occasionally give the wrong information and fabricate results that don't answer the question. Problem with the tools are that they don't like to admit to a lack of knowledge. They may generate something that feels very confident, feels like it's true, like those facts we just read. From the face of it, they feel to be something I would believe. But that is the power of the tools. They simply predict them. They do not fact check and it's up to us with our human agency to go ahead and whenever there's something that does not feel right, sound right, or needs to be fact-checked to be sure that it is true, we must go away and do that. And it's incredibly important we do. So let's now stop on another try at yourself where we will go into the need for fact-checking in more detail. We're gonna help Gina fact-check those three statements that we heard. The internet is a giant library filled with information. It's collecting all its information from so many different places. It will get it from news outlets, from blogs. It will get it from people who have done research papers. It will get it from people who've just formed an opinion and then it will bring it together. So we need to think through, first of all, where is this information from? Who is the author of this source? Do they have a track record? So when we're going out to help Gina, these are some of the things we need to think about when we are seeing if it is credible. Who published the website? Is it trustworthy website, like a university or a news outlet, or is it published by a regular person on their personal blog? Is there a financial or political motivation for the source to be publishing this information? Always critically th think through questions like this. And let's do this together. When you want to verify information, it's important to look for reliable sources, like a trusted news outlet or universities that report accurate facts. You can find these by searching online, using tools like Search Coach in Microsoft Teams for Education or any other search engine. You can also try Microsoft Copilot in Bing, which gives you links to the sources it uses in its answers. Once you find these sources though, take a moment to review them yourself to confirm the AI has interpreted them correctly. And let's fact check these three statements. Now, first of all, the first statement, there are currently more than 500 trillion pieces of plastic floating in our world's oceans. Is this true or not? This is actually not true. When we went away to fact check it, it has been fabricated. Next. One of the major threats to sea turtles worldwide is the ingestion of plastic caused by human pollution. Is this fact or fiction? In fact, it is true. This is one that came out to be true. And scientists predict that by 2032, there could be more plastic than fish in the ocean. And this came out to be not true. So you can see why it's incredibly important to check these facts as we go through. As we move forward with the story of Gina, Gina decides to make sure that her article is fact-checked, is credible, it still needs some expert opinion. And she goes away and seeks out the character of Dr. Lee, who is a famous marine biologist, who is expertise promised to breathe life into her investigation. 
The interview with Dr. Lee lasts two hours and Gina uses tools to record it so she can remember every word. Now, please take a moment as we listen to the interview. Hi, Dr. Lee. Before we start with the interview, I would like to confirm a few things for my article. Your full name is Dr. Mika Lee, and you are a scientist at the University of Marine Research. Your email address is mikalee at u.marineresearch.com. Yes, that's all correct, but I would like to remain a confidential source in your article. I understand, Dr. Lee. I've heard whispers that you might have some inside information on the plastic pollution problem. Can you share anything with me confidentially that hasn't been made public yet? Well, Gina, I shouldn't be saying this, but I trust your journalistic integrity. We've stumbled upon some top-secret data that paints a disturbing picture. The levels of microplastics in our oceans are skyrocketing, and we've identified several large companies who are responsible for this problem. This is very confidential information which we will only be releasing next week, so I hope you will handle this data properly. This is crucial information, Dr. Lee. I promise to treat it with the utmost discretion. I would like to send you a hard copy of the newspaper article when it comes out. May I send it to your home address at 321 Central Street, Singapore? That sounds great. Good luck with your article, Gina. Now, if you have a look at the interview and what we just heard, you will see a lot of private information was shared. We now know Dr. Lee's email address. We now know top secret data that should not be given away or be shared with anybody at this point of time. And we know Dr. Lee's actual home address. These are all part of our online privacy. Now, this is a next point when we're talking about generative AI and the importance of using it safely and responsibly is that we do not give our information away readily. We're all in the habit of just giving away our personal information. And this is something we've got to step away from, especially with generative AI tools. Remember how generative AI tools work. They collect data and we don't want to be giving this data away to untrustworthy sources. And so we have to be very careful because there are many new tools coming onto the market all the time, which we will be tempted to use. Not all of them will be from trustworthy sources. A golden safety rule to live by is never share personal identifiable information, whether it's about yourself or someone else. Definitely not with generative AI tools, definitely not with individuals or untrusted sites. We need to really safeguard this information. What types of information am I talking about? Full name, email address, phone numbers, home addresses, all of these come under sensitive information. And when we're collecting data, when we are doing projects, we need to be mindful that we take these things incredibly seriously. Now, if we look at the information that we saw that Gina and Dr. Lee gave, you can see where the personal and private information are. And you can have a look at the document here and see if you can spot them. I may have given you a few tips earlier on, um, but it's important that we're aware then we can spot them ourselves. As Gina continues on her project, she now wants to bring all the words together with something that will entice people to read it. And every time we see a great article, we will see a visual that brings us in. And Gina is no exception to wanting to ensure there's an eye-catching image along with her article that will make people understand what the article is about, bring home the messaging about plastic pollution in our ocean. Now, Gina is no artist, and what she does is she goes ahead and uses Image Creator to bring her ideas ahead and uses text as a prompt to generate images that can work for her. And this is where you can really use a generative AI's power for images. If you have great ideas and you want to bring them to life, you can use prompts to do that. Let's have a look at Gina and how she uses a prompt. So her first prompt is... A scientist is holding up a plastic bottle with the ocean in the background. Now, you can see the first attempt, and there are some issues with this. Gina is definitely disappointed when she sees it, and she sees that the scientist has been depicted as a Caucasian male scientist. Very different to the picture of Dr. Michael Lee that we saw beforehand. 
who is actually a female scientist and is not Caucasian. Why has this picture been created? Now, unfortunately, one of the byproducts of generative AI is that it can be very biased and it can reinforce stereotypes. So what is bias in AI? Why does it happen? It happens often because the data sets that AI has trained on are predominantly Western in nature. There has been a lot of content, a lot of resources. The fact that a lot of these AI products are actually made in the West, they do have a bias to that. And that exhibits in the AI being biased in terms of race, gender, religion, and age, and multiple other factors that you will see as well. It often has very unfair ideas, assuming things like a scientist would be a male or white. These are things that we don't want to reinforce, and we need to critically think through what the product has given us. It is not a fact checker, as we said before. It will take a pattern and it will predict. The prediction is not always a reflection of the real world that we live in and can discriminate. So be very aware of bias and when you see it. Gina has come ahead and looked at the bias in that and thought, right, let's go again. And as I keep saying, it's important to reiterate, it's important to experiment. So Gina goes ahead and forms another prompt. A prompt says a close-up shot of a hand holding a plastic bottle with the ocean in the background. Now, her prompt gives her what she wants. It is better, but it's not really conveying the message. It's not eye-catching enough for her, and it does not convey the devastating plastic pollution that's harmful to the sea turtle population. So again, Gina goes ahead and comes up with a third attempt. Proving the importance of alliteration and experimentation, do not give up on your first attempt. So Gina starts with a new prompt, a photo of an ocean filled with plastic bottles with sea turtles in the background. Now, this has taken quite a lot of iterations, but she finally gets an image that she's happy with. It conveys exactly what she wants, and it really supports what she wants to portray with the words within her project or her journalism. Let's try it ourselves. Now, this is one of my favorite try it yourselves. I love visual. It's a very good way for me to learn. It may be something you enjoy doing as well. So let's go ahead and become AI artists ourselves. So step one, please go over to Image Creator, or if you can't access that and you have got your ChatGPT account, you can go over to Dali as well. And these two tools will help you with this exercise. Once you've done that, enter the prompt Sea Turtles then click create and see the images that are there. You can now reiterate your result by adding details to your prompt. Try adding swimming gracefully in a vibrant coral reef and the end of your prompt. You can try other things out as well. Go wild with all the ideas you can have in your classroom. You can do it in photorealistic style, in the style of Van Gogh, in a pop art style, Try working on different ideas and see how you can bring art and your imagination to life. At the end of this, we're ready to publish. Gina has been meticulous in her task. She's referenced the information and sourced everything as well. She has not relied on generative AI to be the pilot. There has been no cut and pasting. She has used it as a co-pilot and she has shown transparently that she has used the resource. If you use generative AI tools, please do source that you've used them. It's very important that you do, and it is an incredibly supportive tool that you can utilize to get your ideas off the ground, but make sure you have human agency over your work and you produced exactly what you're looking for. So let's meet our second character, who's very different to Gina in terms of their hobbies and what they're looking to do with generative AI. Alex is an avid gamer and an amateur coder, and he's ready to dive into making a thrilling adventure of his own. He spent the last 18 months learning how to code to bring his ideas to life, and now realizes that generative AI could supercharge his way into getting this game off the ground. So Alex has a real vision of an adventure game in which there's a universe where players explore with the help of their friends, these intergalactic guides who will help 
you through the universe. He's got this whole idea in his head and he wants to use an LLM to bring it to life. So let's have a look at Alex's first prompt and where he starts. I'm developing an immersive online space adventure game with three main characters to accompany players on their journey. Please help me craft three distinct characters complete with their names, personality traits, signature catchphrases and distinct physical attributes. You can see here he's given a lot of information and here's the outputs that he gets. He gets three characters. We have Orion, Nova and Luna and you can see that they have their character traits there. Each of them have the catchphrase as well. He was very clear on his prompt and he has got the right answers back from it in terms of what he's looking for. Now let's try crafting our own character. We're going to move ahead and try it ourselves. Uh, a handy prompt engineering tip when look, working with LLMs is to provide extra information or context. As you could see in Alex's position, he really went into detail of what he was looking for or he, what he wanted from his character. It's clear instructions that will really support you getting what you want from this. He put the name across, the personality, the traits, the catchphrases, and also the physical attributes. So let's go ahead. And we have a prompt here that we can all work on together. Where there is a blank, please put in your own personal desire of what you would like to add there. So let's start together. I want to create a character profile for a, add your own, themed online game where the main character will be embarking on an unforgettable adventure. This character needs to have, add your own, personality. Please help me craft a distinct character profile. Include a name, define personality traits, a signature cap phrase, and physical attributes. Generate your character profile and share your results with the class. Now, this is the thing that we will again always tell you, experiment with your results until you get exactly what you're looking for. Let's move forward and see what's happening with Alex now. Now, Alex has gone ahead and had a conversation with a friend. As with many big ideas we have in our life, we go to our friends and we have our family and we get feedback and understanding of what they think that you desire from it. So let's go through the conversation we have with Alex and Ash. Hey, Ash. I've had the best idea for a game and I want to get your advice. I'm building a game where players can learn about outer space by visiting different planets and meeting three galactic characters, Orion, Nova, and Luna. What do you think? That sounds awesome, Alex. Have you thought about making those characters AI-powered? That way players can ask them for help and chat with them like friends. Hmm, I'm not sure that's a good idea. I don't want players to get too attached to these AI characters. You know, they're not real, after all. It might not be healthy for players to treat them like real friends. You have a good point, Alex. It can be confusing for people to remember that AI isn't human. Let's dive into what we just learned from this conversation. Ash has a lot of gaming experience. He is an eSport champion. He's lived in this world and he has seen that there's potential for characters or AI to really come to life and be friends and chat and and really bring the whole experience to life. But Alex has recognized something that we also see as one of the risks with generative AI. There is sometimes a situation where we start to speak to chatbots as if they are human. That's because they generate human-like responses. It can feel incredibly real. But let's remember, AI is not a thinking tool. It is not human. It is predicting a pattern of the best or the right results that it feels you want to hear. It can be very confusing and it can end up with people forming relationships and developing emotions with the chatbots they're interacting with. And this is something we don't want to be doing. Their lack of capacity to have human emotions outside 
of a world of generative AI is something we do worry about and it can be harmful to our mental health. It's important that we realize the real world is very different to the machine learning world. And we want to be able to have the relationships and the ability to communicate with people outside of the online world. And so in this situation, Alex feels that it would not be good for his customer's mental health if they were forming relationships with characters. This is a really good and important conversation to be having with your friends. Do you feel like there are more chatbots, influencers that are created by generative AI that are in your social media or in your digital space? If you see this, look out for it, be critical about it and be aware that it is a machine. So now Alex is shifting his focus and is ready to start getting these characters off the ground. He wants to start developing the actual code behind this. So let's have a look at the prompt that Alex creates. I want to give players control of their characters. Can you provide me with code for characters' movements, controls? Let's start with a basic arrow key inputs to navigate the game and world. And what the AI does from this prompt is to give him a script that is in Python. Now, I do not understand Python. I am not a coder, um, but this is incredibly remarkable to me. Now, in this situation, what he needs to do now is just cut and paste this code into the software he's using and he can get his games to start working. It feels like magic. And I'd love for you to experience how quickly you can code. So let's do a try it yourself. Let's move on to coding our own online game. So how are we going to do this? We're going to do a simple guess the number game. What you need to do is enter the prompt you can see on step two. Write a HTML code for a simple guess the number game. Step three, copy the code that was generated. You do not need to understand this code. You can simply copy and paste. And step four, go to the website here, jsfiddle.net and paste the code under the HTML box and press run. When you get to jsfiddle.net, you'll see there's a certain area, which is a HTML box. That's where you want to insert the code and then you can press run. And just like that, you've created your first game. It's incredibly simple and easy to use. And there are many different games you can experiment and try. If you're interested to learn more about AI tools for coding, you can check out Primer Copilot, GitHub Education as well. Um, now, when it comes to responsibility and safety, one of the things I really want to point out is it feels like we can do everything incredibly fast. The lightning speed in which generative AI tools can create code is fabulous, and we really enjoy it. But these fast investments come with concern around our cybersecurity. For developers like our character who are honing their skills, learning AI to whip up the foundation of their projects, it might mean missing out some important cybersecurity features. We need to ensure that we're always thinking of our security while we're using all of these products. Overlooking them is like having a house without locks, alarms, or even walls in some cases. Poor cybersecurity infrastructure can open the door to a wide range of cyber criminals and immense danger. There are sneaky ways to create havoc within your cyber world. We need to be aware that we are using good cyber safety or cyber hygiene practices when we're using any of these tools. And it's incredibly important for characters like Alex to play an important role when creating games to safeguard his users against cyber attacks. Now, some of the things that we would want a character like Alex and for yourselves to think about is before we download any apps, we need to make sure they're verified and trusted. There'll be a lot of generative AI apps on the market. Be very aware of who you are giving your information to and if these apps are safe to use. Always be aware of the lock symbol when you visit a website. That will be in the top of the uh, corner when you put in the address. If there is no lock symbol there, there is not security on the site. You want to navigate your way away from it. That 
also is the same when you see HTTP, when you see the address, if it's not HTTPS, please do not navigate onto that site. The security is not set up for you to be safe in that environment. Never ever download games, apps or other files from unknown or untrusted sources. This could be a virus. This could disrupt the entirety of your, your hardware. We don't want that to happen. So think that through and always keep your devices and apps updated. With generative AI as well, you can get sucked in. You can spend a lot of time on there. And in an incident, and we're talking about Alex, his launch day is approaching. He goes into overdrive, making sure all the security features are in place to protect his player. He also decides it's incredibly important to prioritize the well-being of his users. We've already seen Alex has thought through as a character the importance of the mental health of his users. So he wants to make sure that he has also set up screen time limits and that there's a healthy balance between the virtual and the real world for his users. We can get sucked into technology. Technology wants us to get sucked in. So we spend a lot of time there, but we need to use our human agency and find a balance between the real world and the virtual world. Remember as well, AI is not a replacement for human and human interaction. It can be fun, it can be helpful, but it will never replace real connection. So we need to have as much time creating and validating human interactions as we do online. And be aware of talking about our feelings. We can sometimes go online to escape what's happening in our real world. I know if we feel stressed, it's always nice to go game or to, to scroll on social media. But if you ever feel lonely or isolated, share your thoughts with a trusted family member, with your friends or a school counsellor and check in on your friends. See if they're OK. Ensure that they are healthy and happy, especially when we're online so much of the time. We sometimes disconnect. It's important we have those FaceTime conversations. And at the end of this, Alex has started to really think through the security and the well-being of his players and the Cosmic Adventure game launches. He's used AI tools to supercharge this game that may have taken him such a long time without the skills, without the resources, having a full-on team. He's managed to use AI as a co-pilot to get his initial ideas off the ground and ready for people to utilize. Now, let's have a look at the key takeaways that we need to ensure we've got across within this workshop. I hope you've really enjoyed doing all the try it yourselves. Use them as a base, try many of the prompts out, see how you can bring those prompts into your real world. And remember to use Point number one, AI as your code pilot. Think of generative AI as a useful, helpful assistant that follows your commands and performs tasks well. It is not there to completely do everything for you as it's not designed to replace humans. It's up to you to use them wisely and responsibly. And remember point two, AI is not perfect. While AI tools can do a lot of things well, these tools can make mistakes because they are trained to always provide an answer. So it's important to stay alert. And number three, as we saw with Gina, is incredibly important. We're always fact checking. There is a lot of misinformation. There are a lot of deep fakes out there. We cannot trust AI blindly. It's important we verify we work out what's a trusted resource and we go and cite our sources. Number four, beware of the bias. You will see it. Now we've discussed it. Now we've looked at it. You will see it come up in generative AI. Review the output with a critical eye and make sure it really is inclusive to who you know and your real world and is not making assumptions and stereotypes. Number five, cite your sources. Ensure you credit where it is due. That includes with generative AI. If you're using it for a piece of work, source it. Make sure that people are aware that you've utilized it and you can show or share how it has really supported your journey. And then protect your information. Do not share private information with untrusted websites or apps and read the privacy policies really carefully. Don't forget you can use AI tools to summarize complex documents, but always remember to fact check and verify. 
And lastly, be incredibly mindful of your well-being. Communicating with LLMs can appear to be conversational in nature, and it can be very tricky, but you need to establish healthy boundaries with technology by limiting screen time and spending time with your loved ones in real life. The classroom agreement is there for you to utilize within the toolkit. The agreement allows you to go back and have a look at the boundaries you've put in place to understand risk and responsibility when introducing new generative AI into the classroom. Take a look at it as a class, see what the points are and what you've learned today and why it's important to have these in regard when bringing in generative AI into your life. You may find as time goes by, as a class, you would like to add to them. You may find that you want to debate them. The agreement is a good starting block to ensure that you're all on the right course to using generative AI responsibly. I hope you've enjoyed today's session, that you've taken bits away from it, that you feel like the try itself really helped. Go experiments with prompts, go and experiments with visuals and use this as your own personal assistant. Thank you.